Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Paul Wallace with us, international best-selling author whose books probe the world's ancestral narratives for their insight into human origins, human potential, and our place in the cosmos. And as a senior churchman, Paul served for 33 years as a church doctor, theological educator, and archdeacon in the Anglican Church in Australia. He has published numerous titles on Christian mysticism and spirituality and is a popular speaker at conferences all around the world. His latest work is called The Eden Conspiracy, Ancient Memories of E.T. Contact and the Bible Before God. Paul, welcome back. How have you been? G'day, George. I'm fantastic, thanks, and it's wonderful to be with you again. Thank you. You have done it again with The Eden Conspiracy, my friend. Tell me a little bit about this one. Well, thank you so much, and I should say thank you for your endorsement on the cover because Absolutely. your encouragement, it means the world to me. In the Eden Conspiracy, basically I've circled back to the Bible where I began this journey into ancient E.T. contact, and I asked the question, what are the ancient texts about? If we can accept that there are E.T. entities lurking in those texts that we thought were all about God, and it turns out they're about paleo contact as well, what was the purpose of those texts? What was it our ancestors wanted us to know and to learn when they wrote those texts? Is it about God? Is it about aliens? Or is it about something else? And as I've probed the root meanings of key words, I've discovered there's a really rich education being offered us by our ancestors who bequeathed the Bible to us, lessons in emotional intelligence, uh, social progress, lessons about covert government and hidden hands in politics and economics. There is so much education offered us once we begin reading the text through a different lens. Paul, I've always wondered when the Bible discusses fallen angels, I've always wondered if those fallen angels might have been ETs. What do you think? Yes, I do think some of the fallen angel stories are what we would call ETs. And it's a funny word, angels, because when people hear it, they interpret it in a, in a religious way. They think this must mean a, a spiritual being or an emissary of God. But the word angel actually only indicates the function of the being you're looking at. It tells you that this is an entity on a mission or with a message or sent by someone else. But it, the word angel doesn't actually tell you what kind of being it is. And so when you read about fallen angels in the book of Enoch, for instance, it turns out you are looking at flesh and blood entities who could hybridize with human beings. So that's not how we usually think of angels, is it? No, not at all. And of course, you've come to your conclusion about this, about uh, ET contact with our ancestors. How did you come to this idea? It was really through my background in Bible translation. So I spent 15 years training pastors in hermeneutics, which is the principles of interpreting ancient texts. And so we would learn source analysis, working out where the texts have come from. Are we reading the original form? If not, how do they differ from the original? Form analysis, what kind of literature is, is it? And then always we ask the fundamental question, what do the words mean? What's the root meanings in these texts? And it was really those three questions. When I applied them to anomalies in the text, I found there was another story, just a translation away from being blindingly obvious, that was about something quite unfamiliar to me, and it was the story of paleo contact. We've heard a lot about uh, the Brigadier General of uh, Israel, Chaim Eshman. Talk about his contact and what he has been saying? Well, he is an extraordinary figure. For 27 years, Brigadier General Ham Eshed 
was Israel's chief of space security. And in Christmas 2020, he held a meeting in which he announced that he was publishing a book sharing with the world his knowledge on the topic of contact. Now, bear in mind, it was his job to know if contact was happening, and it had been his job for 27 years. He was a very authoritative, credible person. And at the age of 80, he stands up in front of the press and he says, on the basis of his knowledge, we have been in contact at a covert government level for decades and decades, that there is technology technology sharing going on, that our visitors, who are many, comprise a galactic federation, and that many are here as part of their own research projects. And he didn't go into great detail as to what the research was, other than the USA, Israel, and other world powers were in on these arrangements. Now, it's one thing to read that in the National Enquirer from someone you've never heard of, right. but when it's someone with the credibility of Hayam Eshet, you take it seriously. And he was only echoing what we'd heard from other credible figures around the world. And when he said it, I thought, oh, my goodness, this is exactly the same as what the Bible says in its stories of the Sky Council. What it calls the Sky Council, Hayy Meshed calls the Galactic Federation. And he has no reason to lie, Paul, does he? He's got nothing to gain from it. People might say, oh, he's just trying to sell a book. But really, someone of that credibility at that age, do you really think that's the motivation? I don't think so. He's a very credible person. He's taken a great risk. The natural response of people is bafflement and ridicule, but he's willing to wear that because he feels the topic is that important. What about the possibilities, too, that uh, mankind received a leap of information to allow us to go from one point to another quickly? Oh, I think this has happened many times. I mean, people talk about the technological leaps that we made after the Second World War, which was a time of intense UFO sightings. And those who join the dots feel that's when this technological collaboration began in modern times. But I think you can go back 10,000 years ago and listen to the Babylonian story of Oannes and the Apkalu, or you can go back 60,000 years ago, listen to Aboriginal Australian story from the Yongu people of the Mimi spirits, and you're hearing about another intervention. In the Bible, we've got stories of Dagon and Asherah, and they were entities who were remembered for having come in the deep past and taught our ancestors how to farm, which plants were good to avoid, which were good for food, which were good for medicine, which were good for unlocking our brains, higher powers. And cultures all around the world have these stories of visitors from the stars coming and enabling us to make that great leap forward that turned us from living in subsistence on the planet's surface to being civilization builders. Paul Wallace with us. His book is called The Eden Conspiracy. We'll take calls next hour with Paul. Paul, again, who was uh, Asherah? Asherah is a very interesting figure. She was a female entity remembered by the ancient tribes of Israel. We can find figurines of her scattered throughout ancient Judea and throughout the Levant and, and far beyond. She's emphatically female. The, the carvings emphasize the vulva, the breast, big bouffant hair. And she is remembered as the one who came with others, I believe, and taught our ancestors the secrets of farming. And with farming, come surpluses, and with surpluses comes specialization. That's when you can begin building cities and becoming a civilization. So she was the one that the ancient tribes of Israel commemorated. And to the extent that great kings like Solomon built temples and had altars and employed priests to do services and acts of commemoration to honor her for her contribution to human history. Then there was uh, Shiva Hasamayim. Oh, the Shiva Hasamayim is a fascinating thread in the story of the Bible. It means the sky armies. Now, a lot of traditional translations render it as the heavenly host. But I think when you hear the words heavenly host, you're probably thinking about Christmas carols and picturing ah. the seating of the Sistine Chapel. That's right. But the root meaning is sky. 
shy armies. And if I say that, you'll begin to picture people who might actually have some equipment with them, some armaments with them. And when we read the stories of the Sky Armies, yes, they had armaments, they had airborne technology, and the memory of them was really central to ancient Jewish practice until the 8th century BCE, when kings and high priests started coming on the scene who wanted to airbrush all that memory out and just pare Judaism down so that it was just monotheism, but with none of the memory of these other beings. But there were carvings of the Tzeva Hashemayim throughout Judea and even in the Jerusalem temple. The subtitle of your book is fascinating, Ancient Memories of E.T. Contact and the Bible Before God. How can we have a Bible before God? I know I'm being a bit cheeky uh, with that subtitle, but I've it, it works. That it, it works. <laughs> it does intrigue people because we think of the Bible as being all about God, and God is certainly uh, in the book. And I'm happy to call it God's book, but it's God's book about many things, and many of the stories that we've translated as God's stories are actually stories of paleo contact, which ancient translators have struggled to understand, and they've turned them into God's stories. It's quite challenging because there's a word we're very familiar with, Yahweh or Jehovah, and it's the holy name for God. And that concept is there in the Bible, but that name occurs in much older stories, stories of other kinds of entity, the Elohim, the powerful ones, or El Elyon, the powerful one, the most senior, or El Shaddai, the powerful one, the destroyer, and these root meanings clue us that there are stories earlier than our God stories that have provided the core of some of these ancient biblical narratives. How far back, Paul, do you think we were visited? Or, and was it an ongoing thing? I think we've been visited many, many times. If we look at the Sumerian kings list, it's very interesting that the dates on that, measured in years and sars, take us back to just over 200,000 years ago. And I believe there was a visitation then that was a, a kind of colonization. And our ancestors were on the planet at that time, similar in looks and build, but not quite as clever. Not clever enough to build a farm or, or build a city, but clever enough to mine for somebody else. And I think that was happening then. And then there was certainly another intervention 10,000 years ago. That's the Babylonian story of Oannes and the Apkalu, and the Asherah story in the Bible, I think that's around 60,000 years ago, the one that really began lifting us as a species, giving us the foundations of life as a civilization. But there have probably been many other interventions besides. You base a lot of your books on Eden. Tell us why. Well, Eden is, if I say the word Eden, we think of that as the place of human origins. Right. And I, I find that the Bible and ancestral narratives all around the world are very interested in human origins. But when we go back to those stories, it turns out they're not actually stories of beginnings. They're stories of a rehabilitation of our planet after a catastrophe and a, a, a tweaking of Homo sapiens to get us a little bit smarter. So Eden isn't what we thought it was. And that's why I keep using that name, to take us back to that point that defines who are we, what are we capable of, and who comprises our wider cosmic family. And it's in Eden we find the answers. Where do you think these ETs came from, Paul? Was it one sect, one race, or did they come from all over the universe? I think many. Uh, Hamish Ed talks about a federation, which implies many demographics. Dmitry Medvedev, the previous uh, prime minister of Russia, wouldn't say how many ET demographics we were in contact with because he said he didn't want to panic people. And when I read ancient ancestral narrative, there are a few regions of space that keep getting named. So we have the Pleiades, we have Sirius, we have Orion. So that's at least three regions of space named. And from those different regions, there may be different factions coming from those areas. So I think now in the modern day, I think there are a great many ET demographics interested in planet Earth and Project Humanity, even more perhaps than when our ancestors left us these ancient stories. Did you find uh, references to ancient technology in the Bible? 
Absolutely. And again, this comes partly from going to root meanings of words. So kavod, which we translate as glory, means a big heavy thing. And when you look at what the big heavy thing does in the text, you realize it launches and lands and shakes the land when it does so. We have the word tub translated as goodness, but you look at how it behaves in the text, and it's really a word that means gear or equipment. Get into the book of Ezekiel, and you've got these items, the keli mapasau and the keli mashatau. One is a disintegrator, and one is a destroyer. And they're powerful enough that six individuals can ethnically cleanse an entire district with them. You've got the Urim and Thummim, which are communications devices. So there are heaps of words that suggest ancient technology. And one of the most interesting things you can do when you find those words is leave them untranslated and then just watch what they do in the text. And you'll see that they are doing technological things. Paul Wallace's websites are linked up at coasttocoastam.com. He's also got presence on YouTube that's available to you as well. It's fascinating technology. And how did you find, how did you discover these things? Well, it was I initially an ultimate frisbee injury, which knocked me out of action. It meant I was off work for a while. For, and for, you're not kidding, are you? I'm not kidding. So ultimate frisbee, in case people don't know, is like a combination of frisbee and and rugby football, let's say. And, and it can be rough. And so I injured myself. I was convalescing. And in my books, I use that as a bit of a code for all the time the universe has gifted me for study. And I just followed the white rabbit of Bible translation, going to root meanings of key words. And it was as I did that, that I began noticing the moral behavior of some of these entities and then the technological behavior of some of these items that we don't really know what they are, but we know what they do. And it's really been Bible translation that's opened it all up for me. It's, it's tremendous, Paul. It really is. The work you've been doing. How many years you've been at this now? Well, five years producing the Eden series, so that's Escaping from Eden, The Scars of Eden, Echoes of Eden, and now The Eden Conspiracy. But it had been in my mind, really, since the time I was 11 years old, which is when my mum and dad introduced me to Eric von Daniken. So for decades, I knew there was something there I needed to get back to and pay some attention to. And when I actually did the work, the Bible translation work, I was blown away by how much was in the Bible. And then I remembered that was actually Eric von Daniken's way into the topic in the first place 50 years ago. And not a lot of it is interpretation. A lot of it is just right there under your nose. That's exactly right. That's why I say it's an interesting exercise not to translate these words, so there's no argument about translation. Just look at what they do. Look at what the items do. Look at what the characters do. And it becomes clear very quickly when you do that that you are looking at stories of colonization and advanced technology. Paul, there's been some discussion over the motives of ETs, what they're up to, what they want to do. Some say nefarious, others say not. What do you think? I think it's a whole cocktail. And certainly when we go to the biblical narratives and the stories of the Tseva Hashemayim, the Sky Armies, there's a great spectrum of agendas in those stories. So on the one hand, you've got entities like Asherah, who the tribes of Israel remembered positively because she helped us make our great leap forward. And then there are other Elohim, powerful ones at the other end of the spectrum, who came, exploited us for what they could get out of the planet, used human beings as cannon fodder in their wars. And then you've got others sort of in the middle territory. So in Genesis 6, you've got the story of the Bene Elohim, the ones like the powerful ones. And you could say it's a story of exploitation because it's a story of hybridization. But at the same time, there's technology sharing going on there as well. There are secrets of agronomy being shared, secrets of cosmology being shared. And the Genesis 6 story says that those who came at that time came because they loved human beings and they found human girls were particularly attractive. And so you've got quite a range, some hostile, some helpful, and some sort of in the middle. Well, and the Bible points out that too, that they took the daughters of men, right? Exactly. They took the daughters of men. 
And you could ask, well, what's the motivation there? Was it just that they needed shore leave? Or if we listen to other hybridization stories from other cultures, there's a hint that our visitors are actually trying to strengthen their own gene pool, which has become depleted with human DNA. And there may be others visiting who think we are wonderful in other ways. There are wonderful things about human beings. We've got an amazing capacity for imagination, love, compassion, creativity. And I think some of our visitors want more of that in their own gene pool. So I think that's a motivation as well. Paul, aren't religions beginning to come around and believe that there is extra life in the universe and that it doesn't negate your belief in God? Even the Catholic Church has come around. Yes, definitely. I think that's true. I remember back in 2009, the Roman Catholic Church convened the uh, Pontifical Academy of Sci uh, Sciences to discuss the theological implications of contact with other civilizations. And that happened under the most conservative pope in my lifetime. And when they held that discussion, they met the press and they said, there's really no theological issue here. It just means that the cosmos is fuller than we thought it was. The creator has been busier than we'd previously thought. We should be ready to embrace a brother or sister alien. And I think they did that because they wanted people all around the world not to be panicked if suddenly we realize we're in contact. I actually think they were expecting some kind of a disclosure event uh, to follow, and they were trying to get ahead of the game so that people wouldn't panic, and they could say, no, we've got room for this in our theology. And I think that was a really positive move. I would ask two major questions to extraterrestrials if I had a chance to interview them. One would be, do they believe in a God? What is a God? I try to explain that to them to see what they know. And the other would be if they, to see if they could explain the Big Bang Theory or the beginning of the universe. I wonder if they would have answers for either one of those questions. I think they would have answers, but it's very interesting that religious question, the God question, again, I think there's something very special about human beings that with our capacity for love and imagination and creativity comes a, an aspect of spirituality that I think not all our neighbors have. So they might have thoughts about God, thoughts about creation, the origins of everything, but it's quite possible that you and I are capable of an even more finessed understanding of how that works. And I love, I'm a huge fan of Plato because I think he brings all those things together. He uses language our neighbors would understand and language that people interested in religion and spirituality would understand as well. Paul, in the first chapter of your Eden Conspiracy, it's called Meet Me in Brazil. What does that mean? Well, I said that because it follows on from uh, Echoes of Eden. I ended up in Brazil there, and so I'm meeting the reader there because something amazing happened to me when I was there a long time ago, back in the 80s, and I was invited to a harvest festival. And at first I thought this was like the ones we had back in England where I grew up. We'd have a church service, we'd thank God for the harvest and share some food for the poor, but it turned out something else was going on. And it took me decades to understand what the locals were explaining to me, that this festival, with all the celebration of foods and drinks based on corn, was a recollection of a being called the Queen of Heaven, who came and enabled us to make the Great Leap Forward tens of thousands of years ago. And it took me ages to realize this isn't a Catholic story, this isn't a Catholic ceremony, this is an indigenous memory of first contact. And only when I understood that did I understand why the Pope of the day, John Paul II, was trying to shut all these ceremonies down, because they didn't welcome the paleo contact aspect. But I share that story in Brazil, because in the next chapter, we go back to the 8th century BCE and find the exact same festivals happening there and then, just outside Jerusalem, same activities, same cultural memory, same great leap forward, and the same attempt to suppress the story and delete and replace it with something more neat and tidy. You've been in church-based ministries for 33 years. How do your friends and colleagues react to what you're doing now these days? Well, I'm very pleased. I do have some colleagues from the world of ministry making this journey with me, and that would include senior theologians, 
senior pastors, mega church pastors. But then there are some colleagues who have just gone a bit quiet and they're a bit spooked by what I'm speaking about and writing about because it's naming something that's been a taboo in church circles for nearly 2,000 years. And they just find it too unsettling to look at the things I'm pointing out. So unfortunately, some of my professional relationships have gone a little bit quiet. Paul, overall, with the discussion of ETs, are we going to ever get government disclosure? Well, there's a lot more government disclosure happening now than we've seen in a long, long time. Uh, people were very disappointed, I know, when the Senate briefings happened, but even that thin nine-page document that was presented to the Senate a couple of years ago acknowledged that every six weeks uh, U.S. defense activities are interfered with by UFO encounters. So that's quite a big disclosure right there. And the paper also said there's zero evidence that this is the technology of Earth-based powers. So you've got that going on, which is very unusual. It's quite new. But it's almost, it's not quite the president stepping forward and saying, my fellow Americans, I've got something I want to tell you. But it's a little bit closer than we've seen before, almost as if it's an insurance against disclosure, so that if it becomes blindingly obvious, the powers can say, well, don't you remember we mentioned this? We've been examining their technology. We've had the unit that has investigated crash retrievals for 70 years. So I think there's this deliberate leakage of just enough information so that if it becomes obvious, 70% of us will have worked it out and thought, well, I'd come to these conclusions myself. I'm not that surprised. In the title of your book, The Eden Conspiracy, what's the conspiracy portion? I, you know, I hesitated, hesitated to use that word because it can be a very triggering word. Sure thing. But I, des I decided I had to use it because what I talk about in The Eden Conspiracy is a moment in the history of the Bible where the narrative was changed. And the Bible actually tells the story of when certain kings and high priests decided to get rid of ancient memories of ET contact and replace it with simple monotheistic religion. And the Bible's a very honest document, so it names the people. It names King Hezekiah, the high priest Hilkiah, the king Josiah, uh, Ezra, the priest, Shaphan, the royal scribe, and talks about what they did to shift people's attention away from the cultural memory of contact and turn Judaism into pure and simple monotheism. What that meant was that the people in power knew things that the general public weren't allowed to know. So that's why I use the word conspiracy. And it's a great example of how the narrative can be controlled so that the powers can find the public more <laughs> easy to manage. So with all that story there in the Bible, I thought the word conspiracy was quite appropriate, really. Though you believe some of the things were taken out or removed from the Bible, who would have done that? Well, it was the scribes as they pulled together this vast library of Hebrew scriptures and pulled them together to form the Bible as we know it. And it wasn't so much a taking out of things, it was how things were narrated and translated. So there are many texts in Je Jeremiah and Second Kings, for instance, that tells you that the tribes of Israel commemorated all these other beings, but then the narrator will just add a sentence that says, isn't that awful? sort of in brackets. So they haven't taken the information away, but they sort of discarded it and decided to label it as negative, idolatry, uh, ungodly. But the information is actually still there. And that's what I do in the Eden Conspiracy. I just shine a light on all the information that is still there that is only a translation away from being obvious or that if you just take away the narrator's opinion, you realize he's just told us about a memory of ET contact. You've been all over the planet, Paul. What are you searching for? I would love the human race, all of us, to know who we are, to know that we are amazing, powerful beings capable of incredible things individually and collectively, and to find all the information that that equips us to have a better human experience. And I find that the stories that have been curated by indigenous trans, uh, traditions all around the world have that kind 
of empowering information in them. And are you finding these answers? I am, and everything I find I'm putting into my books. So the Eden series really follows my journey as I travel the world, dig down, and find new information, new story, new memory. And so often there's an amazing overlap from culture to culture telling us the same thing about who we are and what we're capable of and what our place is in the cosmos. You seem to have written a book almost every year over the past several years. It's been one a year for the last four years, which is quite a high rate of knots, but it's because I'm an addictive researcher and I just have to share the journey I'm on because I feel it's, it's that important. And the feedback I get from people is they find it liberating, they find that it puts an appetite, a, appetite on them to search and find out and explore for themselves. And I love that kind of feedback. What will you be working on next? Well, in the next in the Eden series, I'm hoping not to travel the whole world once again, but to stay in one place. And um, I have a country in mind, which I won't name at this point, but I want to go to that country and look at every layer. So current cultic practices, current beliefs, ancient narratives, archaeological sites, artifacts, what we find with soil magnetization, and literally to go down through every cultural layer to see what story emerges about humanity. And I think it, it could be very powerful to do that in certain very rich places around the world, and it produces a picture that is sort of overwhelming. You, you can't escape it. And again, it's, I think, potentially really empowering. Paul, let's assume they came here. I don't know how long they stayed, but why did they leave? Well, I think those who came and colonized us probably got what they needed in terms of resources or in terms of control and were able to leave, but leaving certain mm, levers of power behind. So the placeholders, the kings who replaced them, were really still running things the way our ancient visitors wanted. And many cultures have that story. If you go to Egyptian story, Sumerian story, the story begins with ET rulers, and then there's often a crossover ruler, and then the human kings and queens who follow. And that's rather similar to what we do when we colonize each other's countries. We go in, take control by force, set up the banking systems, the money systems, uh, trade agreements. And then once we've done that, we can go home because we're still sitting at the top of the economic tree. And I think some of our ancient ancestors did something, uh, visitors, I should say, did something very similar with our ancestors. And how long do you think the visitations have lasted, since the beginning of time? I think so. I think it goes way, way beyond the story of Homo sapiens. I think the planet's been having visitations for as long as it's been here. I think so, too. I think so, too. What do you think the real Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve might have been? Well, the conclusions I've reached is that what we call the Garden of Eden was a safe, enclosed zone in the Fertile Crescent where the progenitors of Homo sapiens sapiens were modified from the people who were already living on the planet. And so I think we had the visits of what the Sumerians called the Anunnaki, the sky people, and I think they adapted the humans or hominids who were here already to produce a working class. And I think that's what happened in what we call the Garden of Eden. And parts of that experience were positive for us because it was a great leap forward, but parts were quite traumatic as well. I think being engineered and altered and then being slightly at odds with the environment, not quite feeling like we belong here anymore. It's been very dislocating for us. And I find when I compare notes from culture to culture, it's often the disturbing and traumatic experiences that overlap from culture to culture. So I think Eden was a place where we experienced all that. Absolutely incredible. Paul Wallace with us. We're going to take calls with Paul next hour on Coast to Coast. Paul, where do people get the book, The Eden Conspiracy? You can go to Amazon and Kindle and find it there. And how often are you on YouTube, on your channel? Oh, we're putting up things every week on fifthkind.tv. That's our website. But also on YouTube, you can find the Fifth Kind TV and the Paul Wallace channel. You enjoy this.
I can tell. I do. I'm really in my zone. I'm very lucky that I can do this work and make it my living. I find it important, and it gives me energy to do this. I had fun writing the snippet for your book. It was uh, well worth it. Oh, thank you so much for it, George. I really appreciate it, and I love the feedback that I get from people when they read the book, and it affects them. It affects their journey. It affirms their own thinking, and often people reach out to me through the comments on YouTube, and they're thrilled to find someone who thinks what they do, and it just encourages them in their own research path. Paul, up next, we'll take calls with you. Paul, you're not alone in your thoughts. Graham Hancock believes that the previous civilizations have been here to help mankind as well. Yes, he does. I love his work. There is evidence all around the world of cultures, civilizations that predate everything we know about human history. So prior to 10,000 years ago, the sea levels were quite different. They were much lower. And when they were much lower, they would have revealed cities off the coast of uh, India, off the coast of Malta, Uh, off the coast of Cuba, off the coast of Japan. And I love how Graham joins the dots and says, there's a civilization before that we never learned about at school. And I find the evidence for that in the Bible as well. I think by the time you get to Genesis chapter 11, you've probably read about five planetary resets that would have almost obliterated the civilizations that were here previously. So in the Bible, it's just little hints. But I love how Graham joins the dots and shows us that the story of life on Earth as a civilization is far older than we think. Last hour, I had asked you if they had left and why. Maybe they're still here. What do you think? I think some are still here. I think uh, some of the demographics who are on our side have remained interested and involved for tens of thousands of years. And I think one of the reasons the Galactic Federation, to use Hermes Shedd's word, has been so stable is because we do have friends in high places, so to speak, that there is an agreement of non-disclosure because those who want to protect us from too heavy an involvement Uh, at the moment, I think, seem to have the upper hand, but there's always a leakage in terms of uh, the disclosure, non-disclosure agreement, because there are sightings and encounters in every generation. But I do think we have support that's been around for a very, very long time. I think you're right, Paul. It's truly remarkable. Let's take some calls here for you. Let's go to a first-time caller, Alice in Las Vegas. Welcome to the program. Hi, Alice. Hi, how are you? Good to have you with us. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say that Paul, I think, has uh, uh, presented some conjectures, a lot of conjectures and um, opinions because he has no proof. When he talks about Ashtaroth in the Bible uh, as a person who, as a god, I mean, she is presented as a god, and he says that uh, Solomon uh, worshipped her. Well, Solomon turned away from Father God. And because of his marriage to the concubines and the wives, he, he said his heart was turned to other gods. So he worshipped Astaroth, and he, he worshipped other gods besides her. He worshipped Baal. And Father God told the people, you're not supposed to worship anybody but me. And I think Paul, is dis, he disagrees with the narrative in the Bible. So that's why he comes up with these, these views that <clears throat> Astaroth was this, pers- this god who helped the people, helped them with their farming. And they he, they were a god. She was a god, goddess, who who um, was against Father God. All right, and let's get his take George, on that. George should have should have uh, um, Jonathan Kahn on, who wrote the book Return. Oh of yeah, he he's been on with me before. But Paul, I want you to rebut. Go ahead. Well, Alice, thank you for that comment. And Alice is quite right that that is the opinion of the narrator when he describes, for instance, the kings who built installations for Asherah. So that's Solomon, that's Ahab, that's Manasseh. But at the same time, the narrator is describing what they did and what the cultic practice was. And what he says the original belief was of the tribes of Israel was a positive memory of these interventions. And that story overlaps 
with ancestral narratives all around the world. And so the books I write, they really aren't about proof in a scientific or legal sense. They're saying, let's listen to what our ancestors said. Let's see where these stories overlap. And let's see if we can find any evidence in the present day that corroborate these stories. And so the memory that the narrators of the Bible describe is a memory that repeats all around the world. And so really, I'm affirming what the narrator is saying there. But Alice is right that when the narrator then says that should all be forgotten and should all be obliterated uh, by monotheism, that's where I disagree because my faith in God is not obliterated by acknowledging that we live in a populated universe. And that is the same as the ancient Hebrew belief. Paul, who do you believe Lucifer might have been in the Bible? Some fallen uh, extraterrestrial or what? The Lucifer story is absolutely fascinating. Obviously, it's a name that terrifies a lot of people when they hear it because it's a word associated with the devil, with Satan, with anti-God. But in the work I've done, I've found that many of the biblical stories are a retelling of the ancient stories from out of Sumeria, Babylonia, Arcadia, and Assyria. And many of those stories are not about God, anti-God. They're actually about conflicts among the ETs who visited us in the deep past, the wars that they experienced, the conflicts that they had over how to manage Project Earth. And I think some of the Lucifer stories are part of that strand of narrative. We're taking calls this hour with Paul Wallace, author of the Eden series. The last one is called The Eden Conspiracy. Let's go to Frank in Hollywood, Maryland. Hey, Frank, go ahead. Howdy, George. Glad to be back with you. Thank you, sir. What, I, what, I, what I'd like to know is the number of people of the world, when they find out that the UFOs exist, and I mean when they, they know for sure, like when a UFO crash lands in North Africa, United States and Russia are going to claim it's their experimental vehicle. When they find out for sure how many of, of the people of the world won't be able to handle it, and the number of government officials that couldn't handle it and committed suicide over the years. And then the thing about the uh, Big Bang, until someone proves to me otherwise, why couldn't it be God's hand that started the Big Bang? Because... Before the planets and the sun was uh, formed, there was nothing but a cold, dark nothingness. So if a cold, dark nothingness was here and always will be, why can't we have an almighty God that always was and always will be? Well, if you accept the Bible, that's absolutely true. But, Paul, you want to react to some of the things he's asked? Well, Frank, I agree with what you're saying. I, I think the Big Bang story is not an anti-God story at all. We're, when we talk about Big Bang, we're really just trying to understand the, the mechanisms right. through a scientific viewpoint. But I, I think, yes, I think the universe had a beginning. I think God, God is the name and the word I use to explain that beginning. But then understanding how it worked is, is a whole other thing. And the other point that you mentioned, I've just forgotten what the other half was of what you said. It was to do with people panicking, whether they could handle suddenly being aware of contact. I think my personal view is that more people have worked out that we're in contact than we generally acknowledge. But one of the reasons I'm so eager to produce my books, the Eden series, is that I find in the Bible and in ancestral narratives, there's a heap of information there designed to prepare people for contact so that we're not panicked when we realize it's a populated universe. And I think if we listen to ancestral narratives with more respect and did more translation work with the Bible, we would not be surprised if we're suddenly having close encounters or mass sightings because our ancestors were perfectly aware of it. It's why I think retranslating the Tseva Hashemayim is important, or the Sky Council is important, because the Bible prepares the reader for living in a populated cosmos. They wanted us not to be freaked out by it. I think most people would say, I knew it. I don't think yes, they'd I be think freaked so. out. Do you? I, I totally agree. 
they may be upset because governments have held back, but they'd s- still say, I knew it. Uh, well, yes, I think that's why what we're getting is this soft disclosure so that drip by drip the information comes out so that people gradually come to the conclusion. I think our governments want to avoid that very percussive moment of saying we've been keeping secrets because of the political fallout the lack of trust that we would then have in our authorities. So I think that's why the soft disclosure route is the one being taken. Next up, we've got Mary in New Jersey. Welcome to the program. Hi, Mayor. Hello. Hello, George. Hello, Paul. I have a question. Hi, Mary. Uh, Sure. All right, a Bible question. Christ is on the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a king and priest of Salem. He met Abraham on the way after a battle. He gave him wine and uh, bread. Um, do you have any more insight? Who exactly is Melchizedek? Oh, Melchizedek is such an intriguing figure because he sort of appears in the Bible story without any introduction, other than we're told he's the king of Salem. And so we assume that's, that's the case. He's a human king of Salem, and yet Abraham venerates him. Why is it because he's come close to his territory? Is it because he's especially powerful? We're not really told. But one of the significances of Melchizedek in the Bible story is that Melchizedek is recognized as having some kind of a connection with God, and yet he stands outside of the Abrahamic tradition. And so that's just a little clue there in the Bible to say that connection with God is not the exclusive preserve of any one traditional people group. It's not the monopoly of the Abrahamic religions. Abraham recognized Melchizedek. And so once you've discovered him, you begin looking for evidence of connection with God all around the world and in every people group. And many missionaries have made a big deal of Melchizedek for exactly that reason. They go to unreached people groups and find, oh, they actually know... 50% of what I was going to tell them already. And uh, Melchizedek, I think, is a figure that represents that connection with God that all humanity shares. Was it the Eric von Donneken books and his work that initially got you into this as you were talking about, Paul? What was the moment that you said, I'm going to study this? When I was 11, I picked up Chariots of the Gods by Eric von Daniken, and what touched me was I felt that he had put his finger on something that I'd noticed at school, whether I was listening to religious explanations of human origins or scientific explanations, there was a gap in our ability to explain ourselves. We're ill-adapted to our planet. The only reason we're the alpha species is because of higher intelligence, higher consciousness. You know, without being able to build a shelter or a weapon or a fire, we're in trouble in the wilderness. So how did we get the intelligence and consciousness? Science couldn't tell me. Religion couldn't tell me. Eric von Daniken said our evolution makes better sense if we allow for the possibility of external help, external interventions. And I felt that that matched what we know about human history better. So that always sat with me. And I... I, just niggled away at me for decades that I have to get back to that and I have to test that. And once the colloquium had happened in 2009 where we had Catholic figures saying there are ETs in the Bible, I, I, knew, I thought someone is going to write a book about this and it needs to be me because I had a passion, a fire in my belly by that point. And uh, you picked at least a great book to follow up on. Well, yes, thank you very much. What do you think of the work of the late Zechariah Sitchin? Well, it's funny. When I wrote Escaping from Eden, which is my first book about paleo contact, I'd never heard of Zechariah Sitchin. And it was only as I came towards the end of my research path and producing that book that I discovered him. And I thought, oh, there's somebody else who's come to very similar conclusions. Should I stop? and read everything he wrote before continuing. And I decided, no, I won't do that because I don't want to write a he said, she said kind of book. I've got my data. I'm applying my logic for my skills in hermeneutics. If I reach similar conclusions to Sitchin, it's then much more interesting to the reader to find people coming from completely different start points and landing on the same page. If we overlap, we sort of corroborate each other. And so I really value Sitchin 
uh, from that point of view. But he was very important because he really showed the world the ET implications of the ancient Sumerian narratives. Text and tweets. What do you have for Paul, Tom? Hey, Paul, Cynthia in Nebraska wants to know if you think that the human potential is something that most people do not reach in their lives. Yes, I do, because I think we're simply not told about it. It's another reason I love these uh, world ancestral narratives, because when they talk about human origins, they all talk about a moment where our ancestors were smarter than we are now. So they had far sight, remote viewing, future sight, precognition, empathy, telepathy, better self-healing. And many narratives around the world, whether it's the Mayan story or the epic story from Nigeria or the story of Zeus and Prometheus or the story of Genesis 11 uh, and the Tower of Babel, there's a moment where we're dumbed down. But the way we're dumbed down is by things being put into the environment that will damage our health and mental health. And the positive take home from those stories is that if we pay attention to a clean environment and a clean diet, we can expect our brains to start operating better. And there are shamanic and mystical protocols curated by cultures all around the world designed to help us get our brains working better uh, so that we again can enjoy better remote viewing, better precognition, etc. But, you know, many of the stories we grow up with in school and in church don't tell us that we are capable of more. But our ancestral stories say that we are. And that's why I love shining a light on them. Paul, what was it about the Bible that convinced you that we are not alone? I think it was the the overlap of stories, because the way I used to read the Bible, it was the Bible against the world. It was the Bible against every other culture. But when I did the translation work going back to Root Meanings, I found that its stories of beginnings run in parallel with ancestral narratives all around the world. They parallel the Mayan stories, the epic stories, the Greek stories, the Sumerian, the Babylonian, so on and so forth. And it was when I saw the overlaps between the biblical narratives and these other ones that I thought, these are memories. These are not invented stories that are just coincidentally similar around the world. All these cultures have seen and heard the same thing, and they found a way of preserving that memory. And it was the overlap that convinced me I had to read these differently and take it as cultural memory. What do you think of the Roswell crash in 1947? I think it is one of the most important incidents in modern history. I absolutely applaud the work of the late Ed Mitchell, who shone a light on the witness testimony. And he was born out there, by the way. He was a local. That's right. So he wanted to honor the locals and uh, the old folk among whom he'd grown up who before they died, so many of them wanted to get off their chests what they'd been too frightened to share because they'd been threatened by their own military. And he put the stories together, and we now have a lot of eyewitness testimony from that crash that gives us a very strong indication we've had contact and technology sharing from that time to this. And I think anyone who pays any attention to that story will realize it's not an invention, but the whole town carries a memory of what happened and it informs us that we're not alone. We're getting some emails, Paul, from people who want to know if they can email you through your website. Can, yes. If you go to paulanthonywallace.com, Anthony with an H and Wallace, W-A-L-L-I-S, paulanthonywallace.com, there's a contact tab, and you can reach me through that. People do that all the time. If you want to do coaching with me, go to my website, and I'll meet you there. Paul, what do you think is the most logical explanation behind the existence and visitations of ETs? I am a great enthusiast for the theory of panspermia. and That is a belief held by many eminent scientists in the field of uh, genetics, DNA study. It's the idea that the genetic coding for biological conscious life is as much a part of the properties of the universe as the properties of light or gravity. And that whenever that genetic coding lands in an hospitable environment, a planet with water, it will generate forms of life similar to the ones that have grown up here. 
And so that's an explanation that sees life as the norm in the cosmos rather than the exception. And you will naturally expect life to have started earlier in some places than others. So it means there's a cosmic family that fills the cosmos, that those who visit us are ultimately related to us. They may be a more ancient species or one that's developed technology faster than we have. But ultimately, all life in the universe is the result of the same cosmic seeding. And that's why we should expect contact. Back to the phones, Joe in Long Island, east of the Rockies. Hey, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, how you doing? Uh, my question would be, uh, mainly, you know, you were talking about angels and uh, flesh and blood. Now, what would you speculate? Why would they just not say, hey, I'm an angel? You know, if they're going to help you fix a flat tire, then maybe disappear suddenly then that kind of shows you that. But, you know, it's like a hint. But what would you say about that? Why wouldn't they just be plain and identify themselves? Well, I'm or... not sure they have identified themselves. What do you think, Paul? Well, I, I agree with Joe's question because it's not hard to find people who have angel stories, whether they use the word angel or, or not. They'll talk about somebody appearing from out of the blue. And miracles. In a desperate situation. Yeah. That's right. Miraculously helping them, you know, replacing a tire when they're out in the wilderness, that kind of story. And uh, so Joe's asking, why don't they just identify themselves and say, hey, I'm an angel, I'm here to help you. I don't really know other than... I do think the policy of non-disclosure has been set not by human governments, but by our ET visitors. So I think there's this rule of non-interference, non-disclosure. So maybe that's why they don't announce themselves. But when they arrive from out of the blue, help you miraculously and disappear, I think we could probably join the dots. Possibly. What if they're tricksters, Paul? Well, I, the, the, most of the stories I hear are actually stories of help, where all that's happened is somebody was in trouble and they got assistance. They didn't have food, they got food. They didn't have shelter, they found shelter. Their vehicle was broken down, it was repaired. It's amazing how prolific these stories are, and stories of healing as well. You know, babies who the hospital couldn't help, and then some strange figure appears, and overnight the baby recovers. So these, again, they're, they're, they're not Mars attacks. They're not invasion of the body snatchers. They're stories of positive help and company that is supportive of the human experience. West of the Rockies, McKinley's with us in California. Hi, McKinley. Well, thank you for the opportunity, George. That helps so many people. Thank hey, you. Uh, regarding a populated universe or, or a universe that's populated, it's not only with individuals but with governments, is uh, borne out by the fact that in two letters written to the Colossians and the uh, and the Ephesians uh, centuries ago uses the phrase governments and authorities, principalities and powers in heavenly places. And then also the first chapter, in the first chapter, in the first verse of the book of Hebrews, it mentions about a son through whom all things were created, uh, and, and it says he created the worlds, plural, he, the worlds, plural. And finally, uh, that person is mentioned in the book of Micah, who, who spoke about his uh, coming to this planet in the form of a babe that would be born in Bethlehem. And he said regarding that babe, it says, whose going forth has been from of old, his going going forth from of old. So he had he has been had been going forth to other places before he came to this planet. Interesting take. What do you think of that, Paul? Oh, McKinley, what you said is so interesting. We could talk for hours on the topics you've raised. I think you're quite right that there is language in the New Testament and the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, that do make reference to a much more developed understanding of the cosmos, an understanding of dimensions, an understanding of authorities out there in deep space. 
The Apostle Paul uses that language as you referred to. In the Hebrew Scriptures, we've got the Tseva Hashemayim, we've got the El Badat, which is the Council of Powers. I think you're right. There's much more there than we commonly spot that says not only is there life, but there are authorities and powers that we're bumping up against in our experience of life on Earth. And then the other thing you mentioned that's absolutely fascinating is the layer of precognition in the scriptures themselves. And my wonder at the Hebrew scriptures only grows and grows because I realize there are layers and layers of information in it. There's the familiar stories, which is the narrator's story. And then there's the original stories, which we get to through root meanings. But then there's also this this insight, this precognition that some of the prophets who produced some of that literature had access to as well. So, you know, the Bible is a book of many, many layers, and we could probe it for a lifetime. So, uh, McKinney, I really love that question that you asked. Thank you. Final text and tweets. Tom, what do you have for Paul? Hey, Paul, Johnny in Glendale, California, would like you to talk about the reasons we don't get high-profile visitation cases anymore, such as Roswell, Rendlesham Forest, or Phoenix Lights. Oh, Johnny, that's a really good question. I profile, well, I, I wouldn't hold your breath because I think there are still mass sightings happening. I think probably once we take our attention off the USA and start looking around the world, we'll find there are more recent mass sightings. If you go to a country like Chile, for instance, where there isn't the same taboo over the question of contact, you will have more recent stories there. Whether they are less frequent, I'm, I'm not sure that's right. And uh, even with that paper I mentioned before, the Senate briefing paper, once every six weeks, those are group sightings we're talking about. So technically, those are, those are mass sightings once every six weeks. So I think there's probably much more going on than reaches the TV news. I think so, too. Let's go to some more calls here. Let's go to... Don in Kent, Ohio. Is that where you are, Donald? Hey, God bless you. You know, uh, George and Paul, great program. And Alice from New Jersey, great call. You know, in Isaiah 24, uh, Judgment Day, God punishes the host of the high ones along with the kings of the earth. You know, Jesus warned us five times in uh, Matthew 24 about not being deceived. And it seems like we forgot that message in Revelation 19 when the kings of the earth fight against God upon his return. What say you, Paul? Oh, gosh, that's a very layered question indeed. I think there are a lot of texts that we inter- that can be interpreted in many ways. So you can read it in a religious sense, and we read it through a framework of worship and obedience. But then there are other texts that I think are much more about cosmic conflicts, And we can misunderstand what the writers are telling us if we think it's all about worship and obedience. Some of these texts are much more nuts and bolts talking about conflict in space and geopolitical conflict on the planet and helping us to navigate those. But uh, for a fuller answer, I probably need many more minutes. So I'll just have to leave it at that. Sorry if that disappoints. Paul, uh, do you come across anything that would uh, tell you what kind of technology they possessed, what kind of propulsion systems they have? Are they bending space and time? How are they getting here? There are three technologies named in the Bible, which are really intriguing. So the probably the most familiar is the, uh, the pillar of cloud, which is... Um, we now, having watched SpaceX launches and landings, we can picture what is described in the ancient texts as it launches and lands vertically. So we've got that kind of technology, which looks like rocket technology, which sounds a bit surprising for really advanced beings. There's a capsule that belongs to that rocket, which then uses rotors to fly. So something like a helicopter or a drone is described in Exodus and Ezekiel. So we've got very nuts and bolts kind of technology there that's quite surprising. It's noisy, it's smoky, it's fiery. But then there's something even more mystifying, which is that before these pieces of technology arrive, 
a hole in the sky appears. So this is where the writers say the heavens opened. It means there was a hole in the sky, and then the craft, the chariot of fire, came through it. And that suggests to me that there was subspace or pinging technology being described, but then also very 3D fueled technology, rocket driven, rotor driven as well. All those are described in the Bible, and they're all in the Vedas as well. If you listen to the, the stories from out of the Hindu tradition, again, very, very much like vehicles that we've seen in our time, other than the pinging, which we've only seen our visitors do. But I reckon we've probably got that technology at a covert level. Next up, we've got Keith in Dallas, Texas. Hey, Keith, go ahead, sir. Hey, George. And um, all right. Um, on that note, uh, I'll ask this question because uh, I know you had mentioned uh, the Vedas and you know some of the technology, but obviously there's ra- evidence of radioactive isotopes, for example, found in the Indus River Valley civilization. And my question is this: is that whatever conflict was going on, you know, it's going back tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago. In, in your view, is it best to describe that as conflict between you know, the gods themselves, these ETs, whatever we want to call them, or was the conflict happening amongst their descendants, meaning, as she referred to earlier, the people that they put in charge once they left, and did those people then kind of turn against each other? And so I'm thinking about, you know, the ancient Mesopotamian texts related to the Anunnaki, and then also um, some of the wars depicted in the Vedic um and the Vedic stuff. And so is this all the same thing? Is it different things between, you know, Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley? Or is it their best attempt to describe their memory in these different civilizations? Like, what are we talking about here? Oh, Keith, that's a great question. Yes, I do think it's memory, and it's memory of the same conflicts and the same eras of conflict. I think where we have stories such as in the Vedas, the Bible, the Sumerian texts of wars in the heaven, where it's technological war, that is the wars of the visitors conflicting over Project Earth. And to go back to Don's question where he's talking about how the kings of the Earth are involved, some of the kings of the Earth named are not necessarily human kings and queens. Uh, and that's especially clear in the Sumerian stories and I would say in the Vedas as well. So where it's technological battles, that's human memory of our visitors conflicting over Project Earth. And then I think we have a memory of the technology, an attempt to reproduce it, but certainly in the Bible and in the Mayan story, when it comes down to the human kings, all they can do is build copies that are not functional but they're trying to reproduce what they remember, the technology that was used before, the weapons, the flying craft, the remote communication equipment, so on and so forth. But I think essentially, yes, we have memories of wars that were fought using technology that we didn't understand, but we remember what it looked like, what it sounded like, and the effects that it had. Paul, where do people get the Eden book series, including the Eden Conspiracy? If you go to Amazon and Kindle, you can get all of the Eden books, Escaping from Eden, The Scars of Eden, Echoes of Eden, and The Eden Conspiracy. So Amazon Kindle is the place to go. And you can keep up with me on my website, which is paulanthonywallace.com and at thiskind.tv. And on those websites, they can get to your YouTube channel? Yes, they certainly can. So there's the Fifth Kind TV on YouTube and the Paul Wallace channel on YouTube as well. I'm in the comments every day if you want to get into a conversation with me. But if you want a longer conversation, come to my website and I'll meet you there. All right. Thank you, Paul. Great having you on the program. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.